أفلح من صلى على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن للمتقين مفازا حدا وكواعب أترابا وكأسا بها قل لا يسمعون لا يسمعون جزاء من ربك عطاء حسابا رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما الرحمن لا يملكون منه خطابا يوم يقوم الروح والملائكة صفا لا يتكلمون لا يتكلمون إلا من أذن له الرحمن وقال صوابا ذا فمن شاء اتخذ الى ربه مابا انا انذرناكم عذابا قريبا يوم ينظر المرء ما قدمت يداه ويقول الكافر يا ليتني كنت ترابا صدق الله العلي العظيم الفاتحة تسبيقها الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد أحسنت مصطفى let's give him another loud صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Thank you all for joining us for our weekly Friday night program here at the Muslim Youth Connection. Tonight's topic is overcoming desires and temptations. 
I'd like to welcome our beloved scholar, Samahat al Sayyid Salih Qazwini, after a loud salawat, ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Habibi ilah al-alameen, abil qasim al-mustafa Muhammad wa ala ahli baytih al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونفس وما سواها فألهمها فجورها وتقواها قد أفلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى has created the human being in utmost perfection الله سبحانه وتعالى gave the human being all of the resources and the needs to live a happy, prosperous enjoyable, successful, and fruitful life. You see, everything is under the disposal of the human being. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored the human being. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the human being over all other creation. And the means of Choosing the human being over all other creation is the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed with the human being. Beginning with the intellect, the aql, the power to make sound decisions in life. That is a gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given his other creation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave that to the human being. Aql, they call the intellect, aql. Aql is derived from, the, in the Arabic language, they take words out of other words in order to bring up a meaning. So the initial meaning of aql was when you tie up a camel or an animal, they call it aql al naqa, tying up the camel or the horse or the cattle so that it doesn't go away, so that it doesn't get lost, so that it doesn't harm itself and harm other things. So then they started calling the intellect the ability to make good decisions, sound decisions in life. They started calling that aql because it is the aql that holds you in place. It's the aql, the intellect that controls you and keeps you from making major mistakes in life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the human being every resource to live a successful, healthy, prosperous life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in addition to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets and messengers and divine books so that we build an afterlife as well, an everlasting afterlife. Some of the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in this life is, are mentioned in the Quran, إِنَّ لَكَ أَن لَا تَجُوعَ فِيهَا وَلَا تَعْرَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have given you this life and provided for you the means so that you don't go hungry and you don't go naked. You're covered. You have resources. And you should have resources. You should have water and you should have a cover. No one should go homeless. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored people. Now, one of, in addition to the aql, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted us with certain needs and desires and temptations for our own good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created these needs that we have for the sake of survival, for the sake of living a prosperous and healthy life. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us these desires, for example, hunger, thirst, the desire to rest, the desire to grow a family, the desire to mate. These are all desires that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. Because Islam is not against all desires. Islam is not a religion that's telling you, you know, go live a boring lifestyle and have no desires and totally shut down your desires. No, you have desires, but you have to control those desires. That's the key point. Desires of individuals must be controlled. Otherwise, if they're not controlled, then the aql, the power of the intellect, it will lose its value, it will lose its control. And a person is going to be controlled by their desires. So that means your desires dictate to you what kind of a person you should be. Your needs, your greed, your wants, that's what will control you and define you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, you're a human being. You have been honored. You have been chosen over all other creation. So have the aql, have your intellect decide what kind of a person you are. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the human being to be even greater than the angels. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala order the angels to bow and prostrate to Adam? Because this human being who looks so weak, physically weaker than many animals, and one virus could knock you out, but this human being could reach such high potential where you become greater than even the angels. How do you do that? That is when you allow your intellect to take control. But when you allow the, your desires to take control, what happens to the human being? The human being becomes worse than the animals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that this human being becomes worse than the animals. They are like animals. Then Allah says, no, they are worse than animals. Because at least the animals, they're doing what they're meant to do. They're doing their, that's, that's all that they are. But sometimes some human beings, they become worse when they fall to their temptations and they fall in their desires. This is why we must take full control of needs desires, temptations. And I'm not saying that these needs are bad. No, Allah created us with these needs. However, they were created for a purpose. They were created for a reason. Allah gave you the need of hunger, so you survive. The need of rest, so that you give your body the rest that it requires. The need to eat and drink, the need to mate, so that you grow your family and you reproduce. But once those desires are uncontrolled, once they are out of control, then this human being becomes worse than the lowest of the law. This human being becomes worse than even the animals. Allah says in the Quran, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Every person has a nafs. And this nafs, it has many dimensions. Your soul has several dimensions. There's a part of your soul that pushes you and pulls you towards sin. And this is mentioned in Surah Yusuf. Allah talks about it in the Quran. وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءٍ I can't... Meaning that a part of the soul, a part of your soul, pushes you towards su, towards harm's way, towards desires. That's the part of us that is never filled. That's the part that always wants more. And every single individual, they have their own desires. Some people, their desire is greed. They want power. Some people, they want wealth. Some people, they, were, they are willing to take so much and you know, collect so much wealth that even if people are dying out of hunger, they don't care. Right now there are multi-billionaires and there are people that don't even have food to eat for that day. Why? Because some people, their desires, their weakness is greed and attachment to this dunya. Thinking that they're going to take from this dunya with them to the afterlife. When the reality is no one takes anything. Whether you have 60 billion dollars in your bank account 
or you have six dollars in your bank account everyone leaves in the same way and no one will be able to take anything with them some people their desires force them to go and oppress other people to go and start wars some people they have a hunger a temptation a desire for power and they're willing to cause wars and bloodshed and millions of people dying they don't care and other people they have a sexual desire a desire that is uncontrolled and as we mentioned these desires, even the desire to collect wealth, there's nothing wrong with it if you're collecting to provide for your family. But it becomes wrong when you're collecting more than what you need. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, when people take more than what they deserve, they're essentially taking from someone else. They're taking from the resources of someone else. And that's what causes poverty. Similarly, the sexual desire, the desire of intimacy, that is a desire that is necessary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everyone with that. But when it's gone unchecked, then it will not only destroy the individual, but it will destroy the community and society as a whole. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Every nafs it has the fujur, the part, the dimension that pushes you towards sinning, and there's a dimension that pushes you towards taqwa, that pushes you towards fear of God and having control and being afraid of the consequences of the actions. And this is also mentioned in Surah Al-Qiyamah. لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة The Quran mentions three souls, three types of souls. One is the nafs al-ammara bisu in Surah Yusuf. The second is the nafs al lawama the part of you that after you have done something wrong, every person with a conscience, they feel the regret, they feel the shame, they feel the guilt. Some people, because they're so used to sinning and doing wrong that they don't even feel that anymore. And that's a sad reality that some people experience. But typically, when someone does something wrong, they feel it. They know that they have done something wrong. This is the nafs al lawama the self retribute, the self, the, the part of you that tells you why did you do that? Why did you do wrong? لا أقسم بيوم القيامة ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة. And then there's another one, the third and the highest level of souls. That is the soul that has achieved and attained inner satisfaction, and that is mentioned in Surah Al Fajr. Surah Al Fajr. At the end of Surah Al-Fajr, يَا أَيَّتُهَا النَّفْسُ الْمُطْمَئِنَّةِ إِرْجِعِي إِلَىٰ رَبِّكِ رَاضِيَةً مَرْضِيَّةً فَادْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي وَادْخُلِي جَنَّتِي The soul that is mutma'in, that is at peace, that is the soul that the intellect has taken control of that soul. And the intellect guides that soul to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where it is connected with God and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is connected with this individual. So desires are not always bad, but we just have to make sure that the nafs al-ammara, the dimension of the soul that pushes us, that constantly pushes us to feed that desire, that has to be in check and that has to be in control. Otherwise, Islam does not forbid the beauty of this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created beauty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Halal means of satisfaction for people. Allah did not create it so people just look at it. No. If you have resources, enjoy it. If you can do something that's halal, do the halal. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِهِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ قُلْ هِيَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا خَالِصَةً يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Allah says, who made the zina, the beauty, and the adornments of this life haram? No, in fact, it is for the mu'mineen. It's for the believers in this life and in the afterlife. If you take the means of satisfaction and pleasure in this life, and you follow the halal path, then you will have unlimited resources in the akhirah, in the afterlife, of also pleasures 
and satisfaction. So the point is, it needs to be controlled. When it's not controlled, you will end up ruining this life and you will end up ruining, more importantly, the afterlife, the akhirah. People that their desires tell them to, you know, have greed and only collect for themselves and don't give others and don't care about others. That ends up ruining their life. They, they end up not enjoying what they have because they're so greedy. They don't even want to spend and they destroy the afterlife. Those who have a desire and temptation for power, they end up ruining their life and their afterlife. Those who have a desire for food, Allah says, eat, eat. كُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا And don't waste. But some people, they want to eat more than their body can handle. What does that do? That ends up causing suffering. Obesity. Right now in the United States, 40%, more than 40% of the population suffer from obesity. What does that mean? That means that's going to have a financial toll on the healthcare system. That means that's going to cause you to live an unhealthy life. And you're not going to enjoy life if you're unhealthy. So be healthy. Take, try to take the pathway of living a health, healthy lifestyle. And also the sexual desire. When that's gone out of control, you find that problems will emerge. Some people come and say, you know what? It's between me, my body, my choice. I could do whatever I want. And no one could come and tell me how I want to deal with my sexuality. This is the mindset that we get right now. You go to universities, you go to schools. But the fact of the matter is, yes, even something as personal and private as your own sexuality and your own method and means of pleasure, that has an impact on all of society and all of community. It does. Today, there are means of satisfaction, sexual satisfaction, that are outside of the boundaries of marriage. You know what these do? Islam is not against finding satisfaction. Islam says control it, let it be tamed. Because the moment you don't control it, then not only you will suffer, but all of society will suffer. I remember a while ago, probably over a year, a while ago, a young man came to me and he tells me that he's suffering from big, major psychological problems and personal problems. So I said, what's the issue? He said, right now, I don't even know who I am. I don't even know what kind of a person I am. I said, why? He said, because I was addicted to pornography. I used to watch so much pornography that now my desires don't even work anymore. I have lost that sense of desire. I don't even feel anything anymore. He wants to get married and he sees he's not even attached. He doesn't even feel a sense of attachment. So he goes to a psychiatrist, you know, he goes to an expert. He has a few sessions and the lady tells him, yes, I know what the solution is. The solution is, I know what the problem is. You're a homosexual. He, t he comes and he says, I'm not. I don't have a desire for, I don't have a desire for men, but... This is what she's telling him. And now he's coming. He's so conflicted. And this is because of the problems that he caused himself. He wasn't a homosexual. They're trying to impose that on you. Because here in society, if there's a particular mindset, they'll impose it on you through Netflix. They'll impose it on you through TV shows, through commercials at the university. Even if you're not identifying in one way, they'll come and they'll try to push that on you. He wasn't a homosexual. But he had... Because of watching pornography and because of not controlling his desires, he had kind of removed the senses where he doesn't feel any sense of excitement, anything anymore. Isn't this a personal harm, a direct harm that is caused because of the desire that is not in control? This is why desires need to be in control. This is why Islam says there is the public sphere and there's the private sphere. 
your sexuality, your intimacy, your desires, your marriage, keep that in the private sphere. There are certain things in your life that need to remain private. The whole world does not need to see it. It does not need to be expressed in front of the whole world. In this society, they come and they'll tell you, go out public. Go out and show and reveal your sexuality and everything that you have outside in front of the whole world. Then there's going to be no intimacy. Many marriages, many people, they get married and then five years down the line, ten years down the line, they discover that their marriage is not working. Why? Because everything's public. There's no intimacy. There's no privacy within the relationship. The husband, he says, the men on Facebook who are following my wife, they have seen her body as much as I have seen her body. So every, what's, there, what's there that is exclusive for the family, the love that's within the family? And this is why you see that families start falling apart. Communities, it affects yourself. We have a hadith. It says that when adultery, when zina, becomes an adultery is there any relationship that's outside of marriage when zina becomes prevalent in society then many things will happen one al fujah, death sudden death will come to people they don't know what the reason suddenly you see this person just died and had a heart attack now it might not be that person who died, that person was committing adultery. But this is something that will happen in society. This is in a hadith, I'm not saying this. Another is when there is so much adultery, there's a hadith that says that people will resort to homosexuality. This is what's going on right now. So the desires need to be controlled. If they're not, major problems will occur. Major problems will occur. Yahya, the prophet of Allah. Yahya was a prophet of God. John the Baptist. Yahya was beheaded and killed because of sexual desires. There was a king. Yahya is the son of Zakaria. There was a king who wanted to commit adultery with one of his maharam, meaning a lady who was mahram with him. He's not allowed to marry her. Basically, something like incest. So, Yahya was a prophet of God. And Yahya would tell him, this is haram, this is wrong. The lady and the king, they didn't like what Yahya was saying. So the lady, she tells him, I want the head of Yahya to be brought to me. And the king orders for a prophet of Allah, a prophet of God, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises in the Qur'an. That he became a prophet as a child. He was beheaded. And his head was brought to that lady. This is why Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, on his way to Iraq, he would keep saying this statement. He would say, he says, this dunya has no value. What kind of a dunya is this? What kind of a life is this? When the head of Yahya, the son of Zakaria, was gifted as a gift to a prostitute. Of course, Imam al Hussein is saying this because he knows that his head was going to go to Yazid and to Kufa and to and all over the Muslim world. Imam al Hussein was, he was knowing what's going to happen. This is because desires are not controlled. Because the desires are not in control. We even have a, according to some, you know, traditions, that Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, he struck Amir al Mu'mineen because a lady promised him marriage and she said, I want you to, I want the mahar, I want the dowry for you to kill Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. So the desires need to be controlled. Now, how do you control temptations and desires? This is a big question. This is the, this is the million dollar question that many people suffer from. 
They know desires are destroying them. Desires are bringing them away from God, away from their family, away from their, themselves. But there's no control. Some people, they're basically they're controlled. You know, I don't remember which prophet. Probably Yahya, right now I'm not recalling. He saw shaitan or Dawood. He saw shaitan and he tells him, how do you see people? What kind, of a peop what kind of people? How do you deal with the people? He says, there's one group of people. I don't even need to go. I don't even need to call them. They come running to me. They come running to me. Some people, that's it. Their nafs, it's such, it, their, their heart and their soul and their nafs becomes a nesting place for shaitan. This heart that is supposed to be the haram of Allah. Allah enters into the hearts. Some people, Allah is not in their heart. Shaitan is nesting in their heart. And sometimes shaitan doesn't even need to tell them what to do. They go and they do the haram. They go and they do the wrong. Because there are two. There's shaitan telling people to do haram and sometimes it's the nafs, it's your own self. Scholars say if you want to know the difference where shaitan is telling you to do the haram and where is it your nafs, here's the difference. Your nafs, if you see yourself falling into a sin that you are used to, something that you're always doing, something that you enjoy doing, then know that that's your nafs, that's not shaitan. Shaitan, he's going to tell you something that even your nafs, your soul sees it as something wrong. For example, murder. Sometimes some people, they go and they fall in murder. Or things that you did not even imagine yourself doing. You don't even have a desire for doing, yet people do it. Sometimes some criminals, they go and they do certain things that even later on you come and you tell them, why did you do that? They come and they say, you know, I don't know. That was shaitan. So anyways, how do we control the desires, the temptations? There are many ways. One, it begins with making the decision and putting the effort and working on controlling the desires. You can't just live your life and say, you know what, Hayalla, whatever happens today, happens today. If it doesn't, it doesn't. No, it requires a struggle. It requires a challenge. You know, those people who are on a diet, those people who are uh, body conscious, you go and you take them, for example, to the cheesecake factory and they're not going to eat anything. They're going to be very careful. You go and you bring food in front of them. They're going to be very careful. They're always thinking about, okay, today I had this many carbs, I have to have this many and I, have to, I ran this much and I have to do this much. That's a, health, that's a healthy lifestyle. We have to do that when it comes to sins, when it comes to self-control. I have to tell myself, okay, today, did I watch TV? Did I, do, did I look at anything haram? Am I falling in haram? We have to have that sense of awareness. Some people are, are not even aware. Some people are in a state of ghafla. In a state of unconsciousness, they're, they're just on autopilot, living their life, and they don't even realize that they're falling in haram, that they're doing sin. This is why it is very important, according to the hadith of the seventh imam of Ahl al-Bayt, he says, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ لَمْ يُحَاسِبْ نَفْسَهُ فِي كُلِّ يوم. He says, he is not from us, the Ahl al-Bayt, the one who holds themselves accountable every day. What does that mean? That means that every day when your head is on the pillow at night, go through your day, hour by hour. Go through what you did today. What did I do from the time I woke up until the time I'm putting my head down to sleep? What did I look at? Who did I talk to? What did I listen to? What things did I say? Did I fulfill my duties and obligations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We have to ask ourselves. It requires exercise. Just like you go to the gym and you exercise, otherwise you're not going to grow muscles and you're not going to be in shape if you don't exercise. Have you seen anyone suddenly get buff if they're not exercising? Other than me, of course, you know, I, alhamdulillah, I have that. <laughs> but you, it requires, it requires effort, it requires work. You have to go to the gym if you want to be in shape. If you want your soul to be in shape, you also need to work it out. You need exercise of the soul. This is why Amir al-Mu'mineen, he writes a letter 
to one of his governors, Uthman ibn Mad'un. Uthman ibn Mad'un. Uthman ibn Hunayf. Uthman ibn Hunayf was one of the governors of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And Amir al-Mu'mineen, this is in Nahj al balagha Amir al-Mu'mineen, he heard that Uthman ibn Hunayf, who's the governor of Amir al-Mu'mineen, he's sitting in a gathering where only the rich people are invited. And he's the governor of Amir al-Mu'mineen. So he gets up and he writes him a letter. Go read that letter. That letter shows what kind of a person Amir al-Mu'mineen was, what kind of a leader he was. In one part of that letter, Amir al-Mu'mineen talks about what he eats and what he lives by. And he says, I have two pieces of bread and I have two outfits. And then he says, he says, إِنَّمَا هِيَ نَفْسِي أَرُوضُهَا بِالتَّقْوَى لِتَأْتِيَ آمِنَةٌ يَوْمَ الْخَوْفِ الْأَكْبَرِ أَوْ تَثْبُتَ عَلَى جَوَانِبِ الْمَزْلَقِ He says, my soul, أَرُوضُهَا بِالتَّقْوَى Riyadha, you know Riyadha exercise? He says, my soul, I exercise it in taqwa. Meaning I discipline it in taqwa. Why? لِتَأْتِئَ آمِنَةٌ يَوْمَ الْخَوْفِ الْأَكْبَرِ so that my soul can come at peace on the day of the ultimate fear, the day of judgment. The day where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold us accountable for even the slightest things that we've done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold us accountable. So he says, I control and I work out and I exercise my soul so that when I go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my soul will be at peace. وَتَثْبُتَ عَلَى جَوَانِبِ الْمَزْلَقِ Mazlaq meaning something that's slippery, a slippery slope. Can you, can you stand on something that's slippery and it's sloped? It's really hard to stand on it. He says the day of judgment, the sarat, is going to be slippery. A lot of people are going to fall in the hellfire, but I want to stand. If I want to stand, then I have to work out my soul. Then I have to be aware and I have to control my soul. So, we have to be very careful. We have to control our souls and we have to not allow shaitan to take control of our lives. Don't let your souls, your desires dictate what kind of a person you are and don't let shaitan dictate what kind of a person you are. أَلَمْ أَعْحَدْ إِلَيْكُمْ يَا بَنِي آدَمْ أَنْ لَا تَعْبُدُ الشَّيْطَانِ Don't worship shaitan. إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ He's a clear enemy to you. Be careful. This is a, the Quran is a book of warnings telling us not to fall in the traps of shaitan. This is one. Be aware. Be conscious and know that there's a struggle that has to take place. You can't just have self-discipline without going through a struggle, without disciplining your soul. Second, my dear brothers, we need to know the impact of the sins. If you don't know the impact of a sin, then you're not going to see the consequences. Then you're going to keep falling into desires, into temptations. You're not going to care because you don't see the impact. You don't see the problem. If you see the problem, then you're going to be careful. Right now, people don't break the law. Normal people at least don't break the law. Why? Because they know that if they break the law, they're going to end up in jail. They're going to get fined, hefty fines. And people, they know the consequences. They see the consequences. So that's why they stop at the red lights. And they stop at the stop sign. And they're very careful. Why? Because they know the consequences. Those who don't know or don't care for the consequences, they break the law. When it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know the consequences. The Quran tells us what the consequences of oppression is. What the consequences of doing haram are. And if we don't care, then we should care because the consequences are very severe. Losing out on this life, not, you know, being fined here and there, you could survive that. But can you survive one day or one moment in the hellfire? A lot of the people who go to the hellfire, they're not in the hellfire forever. Some people, they're khalidina fiha, they're in there eternalized. There's another group of people who will be there for a short while and then they will leave. But can you bear 
one moment of that scorching hellfire? No. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says that you can't. Amir al-Mu'mineen and the Quran and Rasulullah and the Ahl Bayt, they tell us, they describe to us how bad, how severe it is. Because when you see the consequences of a sin, when you see the consequences of doing wrong, you're going to be careful. You're not going to do wrong anymore. Allah says in the Quran, "Kalla law ta'lamun ilm al yaqin, la tarawun al jahim." If you have ilm al yaqin, if you have knowledge of certainty, you're going to see jahim. You're going to see the hellfire. And if you see the hellfire, are you going to dare sin? No. That's why those who have yaqin, those who have certainty, they don't sin. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, لَوْ كُشِفَ لِيَ الْغِطَاءِ مَزْدَتُ يَقِينًا If the veil was removed, every one of us, the veil is going to be removed once we die. That's when we see, reach certainty. He says, if the veil was removed, my certainty would not increase. Meaning, I have reached certainty. That's why he was living a God-conscious life, God -conscious lifestyle. لَوْ كُشِفَ لِيَ الْغِطَاءِ مَزْدَتُ يَقِينًا so this is second. Know the consequences of the sin, therefore you're not going to sin. Know the consequences of temptations and desires. And those who have temptations and desires, they will see the negative consequences in this life before the afterlife. Third, my dear brothers, is that we need to understand that desires and temptations, they reflect a need that we have. Why do you have a desire? Why does your stomach tell you I'm hungry? Why do you have a sexual desire? Why do you have these desires? These desires, they reflect a need that is within us. So why don't you satisfy that need in the halal way? Satisfy that need. That's it. That's the solution. Take care of the need that you have. Because if you don't take care of it correctly, then you might end up taking care of it in the haram way. And then that's where it will become a problem. So don't create that problem from the beginning, from the first place. Don't allow that problem to begin. And this is why Islam embraces marriage. This is why Islam encourages marriage. Encourages marriage from a young age. If you're able to, if you're capable, why not? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourage, encourages it. وَأَنْكِحُ الْأَيَامَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّالِحِينَ مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ وَإِمَائِكُمْ إِنْ يَكُونُوا فُقَرَاءَ يُغْنِهُمْ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ If they're poor, Allah will give them. Don't worry about their, their, their money. But today, we create problems. When you come and you tell someone, you're at the age of marriage, they'll bring you a huge list of problems. Oh, I'm not ready. I haven't found the right person. I have to finish my school, I don't have money, my parents don't allow it, her parents don't allow it, I'm doing this right now. Millions of problem, excuses, one after the other. Try to find a solution to these excuses. Just as you have millions of problems in life, you deal with them. You have to prioritize what's important. Because once marriage is delayed, what's going to happen? Are the desires just going to suddenly turn off? No, the desires are not going to stop. The desires are going to continue. If you're able to control those desires, then go ahead, delay your marriage. But if you can't control those desires, you end up doing haram, then that means you're putting yourself at a greater risk of problems. Then that means you're putting yourself in a bigger problem. So put yourself in a position where you are going to be able to get married sooner than later. And don't delay it. But some people, they say, no, 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 no. I want to have fun. I want to, get, I want to get married when I'm 40. Let me have fun right now. Let me enjoy myself. No one tells me what to do. No responsibilities, no duties. And then later on, once I want to settle down, I'll get married. This is the mentality right now. But that's a wrong mentality. That mentality is the mentality that says, I don't want anyone to tell me what to do. I don't want to be disciplined. I don't want to have control. I don't want regulation. This is why some people are against marriage. Why are, there are right now, some people, they, they will live together. They will have children with one another. They live in the same house, but they don't want to get married. They don't want to sign that paper 
that's saying that they're married. Why? Because they don't want to be limited. I want to leave the house whenever I want. I want to come to the house whenever I want. I want to have desires. I want to do whatever I want, whenever I want. I don't want anyone telling me what to do. This is why Islam is against adultery and fornication. Because it's a relationship without a contract. Marriage, all that marriage is, is marriage is a relationship with a contract. Giving consent, giving everyone knows what their expectations are, what's expected from them, what they should expect from others. You know your rights and your duties, and you go into that relationship. That's what marriage is. Marriage is knowing, signing a contract, just like you sign a business contract, you sign a marriage contract. Knowing what your duties and responsibilities are. This is why in Islam it's encouraged. Because it's going to keep you occupied. It's going, to, it's going to give you a sense of immunity. It's going to give you a sense of protection. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Man tazawwaja faqad ahraza nisfa deenah. The one who gets married, they have preserved half of their faith. 50% of your faith has already been, that's it, you're safe. Now you have to worry about the other 50%. Why? Because all of these thoughts, all of these temptations, 50% of the temptations and thoughts and desires, they're all going to be gone. They're going to be taken care of. Now, the, th the fourth issue, so find a solution to the problems. Find a solution to the desires in the halal way. You're hungry, go and find halal food to eat. You don't need to go and... You, don't, you won't need to have a desire to go and eat or drink something haram. You have the desire for family, the desire to mate. Find a relationship that's halal, of course, if it's the time. Now, some people, they come and they say, I can't. Right now is not the time. There's also another solution. In the same verse, وَأَنْكِحُوا الْأَيَامَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّالِحِينَ مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ وَإِمَائِكُمْ إِنْ يَكُونُوا فُقَرَاءَ يُغْنِهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهُ وَاللَّهُ وَاسِعٌ عَلِيمٌ this brings us to the fourth solution that we had. And that is, we have a duty to seek chastity. We have a duty to put ourselves in a health and safe space. If you put yourself in a dangerous space, then the chances of falling in haram are going to be more. This is why Allah in the following verse says, وَلْيَسْتَعْفِفِ الَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ نِكَاحًا حَتَّى يُغْنِهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Those who cannot find nikah, those who cannot get married, what do they have to do? Should they go and hang out in the clubs and, and, and watch haram things and ha talk to you know, someone who's not mahram to them all night? No. Allah says, Those who cannot find nikah, halal nikah, then they have to seek afaf. They have to seek chastity. Yastafif meaning... Seeking chastity. Until Allah makes them wealthy from His bounties. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them what they need. So this means that we should not go near fornication. Don't go near anything that will bring you away from Allah. Don't go near your temptations. Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا Allah doesn't say, وَلَا don't commit zina. Don't commit adultery. Allah says, don't even get near it. Don't even think about it. Don't even consider it. What does that mean? That means put yourself in a safe space. That means put yourself in a healthy environment. In a good place where you will not fall into zina and adultery. And you do that through seeking chastity. Don't associate yourself with anything or anyone that might ignite that desire, that might combust and start that desire. Don't go with friends, with people that are going to kick in that desire. Instead, be with the boring people at the masjid. I'm just kidding. No. Instead, spend time at the masjid, work on your spirituality, find a halal relationship perhaps in the masjid, somewhere else, and find a solution. But don't, you don't need to go in somewhere where it's a toxic atmosphere, somewhere where you will suffer and it will lead you to falling into more sins and more problems.
For example, Friday night, instead of going somewhere where the chances of falling in sin are high, come to the masjid. Thursday night, listen to Duhat Kumail. Teach yourself to focus on things that strengthen your bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because, see, your desires, if they're met in the halal way, they're not going to want the haram. So fill that gap, fill that emptiness with something halal, something that is fulfilling, and therefore you're not even going to consider, you're not even going to be thinking of anything haram. One method of, for example, controlling and dealing with temptations is fasting. Fasting is very important, especially these days. These days, the day is so short. Maghrib is, you know, 5.30, 5 o'clock. So you're able, you're, you could fast, especially during the winter. That will give you a sense of self-control and a sense of discipline. Another method is if you find yourself falling in the haram, if you find yourself doing something that will take you out of the temptations and desires, then tell yourself, if I fall in this temptation, if I fall in this desire, then I will fast, then I will give sadaqah, then I will, for example, do this, do something here. So then this will make you be very careful. It will make you be very careful not to do something wrong. Even though fasting and giving sadaqah, that shouldn't be regarded as a punishment, but at least it will compensate for the haram that was committed. This is the fourth point. And the fifth and final point is that be content with what you have. Sometimes some people, when they teach their desires that I'm going to give you whatever you want. You know, it's not only the youth and the adolescents that are dealing with desires that are always telling them. You find people days before their death, they have a desire that they want. Perhaps it's not a, the... A sexual desire, maybe it's a desire for power, desire for wealth. Everyone has desires. Teach your soul that I don't give you what you want at all times. Discipline your soul. And when you discipline that, one of the ways of disciplining the soul is by being content. Tell yourself what you have. Because people who want other things, they're not happy with what they have. But if you tell yourself, I'm happy, I'm satisfied, I'm blessed with what I have, then I'm not going to be looking at other things here and there, things that might cause potential problems for me. Allah says, don't stretch your eyes to what other people have. The beauty of this life, why do they have it? Because they're going to be tested in it. You want, some, you want your test to be more? You want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hold you accountable for more things? Just because someone has something doesn't mean that you need to have it. Tell yourself it's okay. Discipline yourself that it's okay. Be content with what you have. If you do so, you will find that you're not going to go after something that is more farther than your reach, something that will potentially cause major problems for you. So just to summarize, the ways of disciplining the soul, one is you should be aware and you should know that it takes effort. It requires work to discipline the soul. Second, know the impact of sins. Know the impact of what falling in haram is. If you do know the impact of this urge and this desire, then you're going to be much more careful. Third, try to fulfill and meet that desire, but in the halal way. There's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, Islam encourages that. Fourth, seek chastity. Work towards seeking chastity. Take yourself out of the atmosphere and the environment that will put you in harm's way. And fifth, be content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. If you're content with what you have, you're not going to seek anything else. My dear brothers, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all. 
and to help you overcome your temptations and your desires and to help us all overcome our desires and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our desires and our needs and our wants be in a healthy way that will lead us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather than an unhealthy way and toxic way that will bring us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala alihi al-tahirin Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah